Hey, I'm Pastor Goodman. It's the Drive to School podcast, and today we're talking about some things you might see in church. Uh, it's the fourth Sunday in Advent, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56, just maybe, maybe. It's those days when Mary arose and went with haste into Judah to stay with her aunt for three months. Those days being the days right after her parents found out that she was pregnant. I'm not saying for sure that she got kicked out of the house for being pregnant while not married, while insisting that it was totally God's will, but she went with haste. That that means something. It's, it's like she couldn't stay where she was. And, and so I can't say for sure, but as somebody who has been thrown out of the house, I can tell you what it looks like to have to depart with haste. And personally, I don't think her folks believed her. We know that it was a miracle that Joseph did. It happened somewhere between Mary leaving for her aunt's house and the birth of our Lord. It might actually be the real reason that she stayed with Elizabeth for three months. It's almost like Joseph reached out and finally told her it's safe to come home. It's one of those details that usually gets swept under the rug when the story is told by children wearing bathrobes. But even before Christmas programs, the mother of God is always portrayed as so serene. Blessed is she among all women. She is the mother of God, held in higher regard than any. Blessed by God with shame, suffering, loss. What she faces now will only compound. Simeon warns her. A sword will pierce through her own soul as she watches her firstborn son crucified. Today, though, she comes to her aunt, ashamed, afraid, alone, in haste. And Elizabeth greets her in the hope of the Lord, not in the fears of the day, not in the names that Mary would be called. She speaks out loud the promises that Mary has heard, but needs to hear again. She confirms angelic promises with a human voice, and sometimes that that really matters. We, we know the scriptures, but to actually hear them from somebody else when we need to hear them, it's a gift. When all of the things are falling apart and we are deep down questioning, can there actually be hope for this, that somebody would actually speak these promises to us matters. It matters so much that John the Baptist starts to dance along and Mary starts to sing. It is an Old Testament hymn of longing women knit together by the Holy Spirit. It is the Magnificat, a hymn about what passes for fairness in these parts. The rich get no more, but the hungry are filled. The mighty are cast down, but the humiliated are lifted up. It always sounds good, as long as you don't actually pay attention to the person who is singing it. See the serenity you see in Mary. It's, it's not like a secret knowledge of karma. One day it'll just sort of work it all, self all out. It's, it's not even about what's fair. Her life will not follow the path of fairness or even of Hallmark movies. It's a hymn about help for those who are suffering under the bondage of sin. The sins that we have committed, the sins that are committed against us, the sins that are just so ground into our identity that we can't see ourselves apart from them. Mary sings of hope because God sees her in her worst day, in her humiliation. He looks upon the humble estate of his servant. He has regard for her. He sees it all. The things that she is called, the things that she will endure, and he has mercy on those who fear him. He doesn't limit his help to the praises of the world. If the lowly are lifted up and those of high estate are brought down, you gotta realize sooner or later that pendulum just swings the other way, right? The next time the hymn is sung, it's just the people who got lifted up have to get knocked down. It's, it's their turn. So instead, Jesus puts himself into the hymn. He becomes the root of the great reversal. He is brought down from his heavenly throne, robbed of all of his pride, cast out that you would be brought in, our Lord, Advent, to suffer for Mary and for you. The hope of the Magnificat is not about fairness. It's that God regards us. He comes to suffer with us and for us, to bear the cross for sinners who sit in shame alone. And here, Mary's shame and her sorrows are removed, and so are yours. She is blessed to be close to the Lord who saves her from the things that weigh us down. And he does not do it by escaping them, not by teaching us how to overcome them with 12 easy steps, but by bearing all of the damage that all of these sins do. For you too then, this is the same promise. It, it's for you through human voices. We gather to church to hear preaching, to sing together, to not only know the promise, but actually hear it because some days it just really doesn't feel like it, but God has regard for you for this. He will not forget. It's magnificent. 
that at our lowest, most embarrassing moments, the ones that we wish we could wipe from our memory, our frustrated times, our painful days when help seems so far away that the word almost seems to lose its meaning, our souls can magnify the Lord too, because even now, while we wait, our Lord regards us in mercy, he advents. And so today we might have to wait, but we'll sing together because the Lord does not forget. He draws near to save.